everybody. Today's talk is going to be about titrations, but to get there, we got to make a pit stop first and talk about indicators. Indicators are chemicals that are sensitive to pH. Colors change when pH changes. So if you've heard about litmus paper, litmus paper comes from a particular little organism called a lichen, and a lichen will change color when um, immersed in water that has a high hydronium ion concentration. So it will actually change to a red when immersed in acid, and it will change its color back to blue when it's in a basic solution. So chemically speaking, indicators are chemicals that are weak acids or weak bases, and they have a general equation that looks like this. Okay, We have a um, species of indicator here that's attached to hydrogen, so they're chemically combined, and they are in equilibrium with an H plus that has separated from an indicator that now carries a negative charge, so they have ionized in this scenario. In uh, the scenario where the H plus is attached to the indicator, that will be one color, and when the indicator ionizes from the H plus, it will be a different color. In this case, I used blue and red. Now, we can cause this particular reaction to go to the right or to the left by what liquid we put this indicator into. So, in acidic solutions, the IN minus ions, the indicator ions, act as Bronsted-Lowry bases. And what that means is that they accept H pluses. If this indicator accepts the H+, plus, this reaction will swing to the left, and I'll form H bonded to the indicator to give me a blue color. On the flip side of that, in basic solutions, OH from the base combine with H plus ions from the indicator. So these H's will wind up leaving the indicator molecule, hooking up with uh, hydroxide ions from the bases, and then once again, indicator will be left on its own in solution, and that solution would be red in that scenario. So there are a number of different indicators out there. Uh, each one has its own unique specialty, and uh, the specialty that each indicator has is called a transition interval. So each one will be optimum given a certain range of pHs. For example, thymophthalene, phenolphthalene, and phenol red all seem to be way down here with their color changes. This one goes from yellow to peach to pink. This one goes from clear to pink to a deeper red. And this one goes from uh, clear to a baby blue to a deeper blue. But they all seem to happen right around here between, you know, like I would say 7 and 10. So these work well when you deal with strong bases reacting with weak acids. Then we have some that are more in the middle. For example, bromethymol blue, methyl red, these two here, they work better when you have a strong acid mixed with a strong base because they're going to show somewhere in the middle of the pH scale, right around 6 and 7, they're going to indicate when you cross over from the acidic side to the basic side and your two, um, your two concentrations of acids and bases become equivalent. Then we see these top ones here, and they all seem to be pretty effective in the acid range, anywhere from 1 to 5. So thymol blue, methyl orange, bromphenol blue, all of these would be effective um, with a strong acid and a weak base combination. So again, the transition interval is a chosen, uh, indicate, uh, is a chosen range of pHs that you will look at when you decide what indicator to use during your titration. Um, whether or not you have a strong acid and a strong base, you'd use one of these two here. If you had a strong acid and a weak base, you'd use one of these. And if you had a weak acid and a strong base, you'd use one of those, whatever you have in your lab. You can even look at things around us in nature that could indicate color. Uh, for example, someone had mashed up blueberries, uh, set the uh, they went ahead and used the blueberry mash as an indicator in uh, different solutions. They used, seemed, seems like they used every ion number that was, uh, or every pH number that was odd 
from 1 to 14, and you can see the corresponding change in colors with each test tube. So they used a, a blueberry extract as an acid base indicator. Um, there's also a real common one that's used in uh, K through 12 experiments called uh, red cabbage, and that is also a great indicator as well. Okay, so what is a titration for? What do you do in a titration? Well, the whole goal is to find an unknown solution's concentration. So we will use a neutralization reaction to help us figure out our titration. Again, for a review, those are reactions where an acid and a base use a double replacement reaction to form water and a salt. So what we can do is we can test ourselves. We can see, are we still capable of using a double replacement reaction, adding an acid and base, to get a water and a salt. Let's try it out. We have nitric acid added to cesium hydroxide. For those of you who studied uh, acid formulas, you know nitric acid is HNO3. Um, cesium hydroxide would be CS, and that has a one plus charge because it's a group one metal. And hydroxide is a one minus, so it balances out nicely with the cesium. Um, on the product side, what we need to do is we need to trade anions when we do a double replacement reaction. So now H is going to be followed by an OH, so it would be just H2O, that's water's formula, and our CS, whoops, that's a C, sorry about that, our CS would now be followed by an NO3, so we have CSNO3. The last thing we would do is figure out is our equation balanced? Well, let's check it out. We have um, one H here, we have one H here, that's two for the left side, we got two for the right side. N's, I got one left side, one right side. O's, I have three on the left, plus this one, that's four. Here's one, plus three more, that's four. That's everything, we're balanced. Okay, so let's sum up what a uh, titration does. It is the controlled addition and measurement of the amount of solution of known concentration. And here I tried to emphasize what that known concentration was. This item in a chem lab is called a burette. It's a glass tube, it's really tall and skinny, and it holds inside of it solution of known concentration. And we call that the standard solution during a titration. And we're going to react it with a measured amount of solution of unknown concentration, which you see down at the bottom. So this one right here, we don't know what its concentration is. The only thing we do know is the volume. We do know how much is in there. And what we're going to do with this experiment is figure out what it takes to calculate the concentration of that mystery liquid in that Erlenmeyer flask. The titration process is a very sensitive means for determining equivalent values of acidic and basic solutions. And hopefully what you'll see in an added video is the fact that sometimes it's a single drop that can take you from the acidic side to the equivalence point and then uh, to the end point. What are those two points? Well, here we go. The equivalence point is a point at which two solutions used in a titration are present in chemically equivalent amounts. So what I want you to imagine here is that you have an unknown acid, okay? To titrate this unknown acid, you're going to put a known concentration of base in your burette, and you're solely going to drip it into your acid in your flask. And what you can see down here is you see this very slow, gradual increase in pH, the more volume of base that you add. But once you get to about this much in terms of volumes, you see some sudden happenings in your experiment. Suddenly, you go from a pH of maybe 3.5, you jump very quickly to a pH of 7. Maybe one or two drops gets you there. If you add an additional drop, what you're going to see is it's even going to shoot higher. It's going to jump all the way up to maybe uh, 11 and a half or 12 with one drop in pH. And you can check it using a little handheld pH meter. After you've reached that spot, you're going to slowly increase once again. What in the heck happened right here? Well, you basically hit the equivalence point of your two solutions, where you had equal amounts of acid and base in your, in your solution, and you were able to note that by a color change of your indicator. 
The end point is another point worth mentioning, and that would be this point right here. So the equivalence point should be some middle color between your starting color and your end color of your titration, um, which we saw from a previous slide. The end point, however, will be the last color that you see. It's going to be the third color on the spectrum of the part particular transition interval for that indicator. So if I was using something like brome thymol blue, down here when it's acidic it would be yellow. If I happen to reach the equivalence point it would be green and if I was able to add one more drop and send it up to the end point, the end point would be blue and it would stay blue from there forward, slowly increasing in pH. But you know how come that it goes so suddenly to the top? Well, I kind of use the analogy in class of imagine you're pushing a plate off the side of your kitchen table. So you slowly start pushing it one direction or the other and you start hanging more of the plate over the edge. There is a point where you might be able to get the plate to balance and hover kind of like this. But if you go one millimeter more with the plate, it's falling off the table and it's come crashing down on the kitchen floor. Okay, that's kind of how I want you to think of this range of values here from here to here because it's not going to take a whole lot of drops for you to tilt the table and make the ions completely go in the other direction in terms of uh, the indicator showing that. Um, what I'll do now is I'll sync in a video where you can see just how delicate, just how precise and sensitive a titration is. I'm near the end of a titration, and what I'm looking to do, I have an unknown acid in this Erlenmeyer flask here. I have an unknown base in this burette. I'm looking to reach the equivalence point of the combination of this strong acid and this strong base. The indicator that I've used was called brome thymol blue, which is yellow under acidic conditions, green when it goes neutral, and it is blue when it goes basic. So I've already pre-added some of my base to my unknown concentration of acid here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple drops to see if I can reach the equivalence point, which should turn a green hue. So there's one drop, and instantly, I don't know how good it's coming across on the video, but it did turn a bluish color, and with one drop, I'm now, it looks like I'm right about at a green hue. So at this point here, I would probably write down the volume where I finished at and subtract my initial volume for it so I would know exactly how much volume it took for me to reach this equivalent point. Let's see if indeed I really did hit that equivalence point. I'll add one more drop to it and we'll see if that changes anything. So one drop, I'll give it a little swirl around and we see a nice um, sapphire blue color and actually this one jumped back and so one drop I can recalculate at this point because it did go back to the green color so maybe this is the equivalence point I'll add one more drop just to make sure okay there's the third drop swirl it around it turns blue let's see if it holds it looks like it will hold so that last drop before this last one here would be the point at which I would take the volume write it down subtract the initial volume from it and that would give me the amount it took to titrate this unknown concentration of acid okay I want you to take a look at two of these uh, graphs here um, and I want you to I want to show you that each of them has something different uh, as a goal this one here is a strong acid titrated with a strong base. So you see a strong base right here. And right here, this would be an acid of unknown concentration. So to it, we're going to add sodium hydroxide, a strong base. And like we saw before, it's going to climb very slowly. And eventually, it's going to get to a point after you've added maybe 24 and a half, 25 mLs, where it's going to jump from a pH of 3 all of a sudden, maybe in a drop or a drop uh, or two drops, and it's going to jump all the way up to 7. Then you've reached your equivalence point. You add one more drop, and it's going to shoot all the way up to about 11 and a half or 12. So um, this is the likely uh, graph that you would see when titrating a strong acid with a strong base. Over here on the right, we see the exact opposite. We see a strong base titrated with a strong acid. So our concentration of base here 
um, would be unknown. We don't know what it is. So what do we do? We're going to add an acid to it drop by drop using a titration and that's going to lower the pH slowly but at about uh, 12 or 11 and a half it's suddenly going to drop off and it's going to drop you know four or five points down in pH to the equivalence point which is seven and you add one more drop and it's going to drop even further just as fast down to about a pH of three this would be your end point of this particular titration so this one here was a strong acid being titrated with a strong base and this one here was a strong base being titrated with a strong acid remember your overall goal here is to figure out a missing concentration of either an acid or base and to do that you're going to use the other one in order for that to happen okay here are the procedure basics on how a titration is performed okay first of all a measured volume of an acidic or basic solution of unknown is placed into a beaker and that we see down here okay so we don't know the concentration of this concentration question mark we're not sure a burette is filled with the titrating solution of known concentration so here we have a strong base and we know the concentration of this base and we know how much there is because there's little graduations in the burette the whole way down. What you want to make sure is that when you fill one of these things, there is a, a top line where there's no more graduations above it, and there's a bottom line where there's no more graduations below it. You want to make sure you have enough liquid in this portion here so you can have a good initial reading and a good final reading. Measured volumes of the standard solution are added slowly and mixed into the solution in the beaker until the reaction reaches the equivalence point. So what that means is that this base here is going to stream down into this and the closer you get to your equivalence point you're going to see the new color kind of hold from whatever indicator you put in there for longer and longer amounts of time. Maybe at first it's holding for a second then two seconds, then three seconds, and it slowly keeps disappearing. But it hangs on longer each time you add more drops to it. That's your unofficial uh, sign to slow down and start going drop by drop. Because pretty soon you're going to reach a point where it might take five seconds before it goes back. Chances are you're super close. It might take one more drop to reach that equivalence point, that middle color between the two that were for that uh, transition interval for that particular indicator. Record the expelled volume required to reach your equivalent point. So at some point, let's say we started adding it when it was up here, and we finally got our equivalence point at here. That's going to give you two measuring points so you know exactly what volume it took to titrate your particular um, unknown strong acid in this uh, case. Now, titrations are usually done in triplicate, so you're going to want to repeat it three times total, average the three so you have a really good number uh, that you can present to who's ever looking for the number that you came up with. Um, one thing you can also do, um, in the beginning before you really get going, you kind of want to have a ballpark idea of how much it's going to take. So I always do a quick run through right in the beginning um, where I can, you know, instantly when I see the color change, I stop the valve, I turn the valve, and I see how much it took so I know where to slow down and I can get my titrations done a little bit quicker with greater efficiency, but I'm still being very careful as I do it.